wrote PG Partment for Automatically Managing Time and ID Series uh, Partitioning. I also wrote Memeo, which is a logical replication tool. has uh, some unique features to it that some others don't. But, um, so I work for OmniTI. We're a uh, full-stack uh, uh, IT consulting company. Um, we generally deal with uh, uh, web applications that deal with very large scale, millions of users, terabytes of data, and helping people that are um, starting off small and they've, they're starting to scale out, and we try to help people with that. And uh, we are hiring right now. We're looking for um, uh, system, ad system admins and uh, web developers. So if you have any questions about that, um, please come talk to me. Or uh, Robert Treat is also here. He's our CEO. So why, why did, was the whole extension system even made in the first place? Uh, before this, um, you could actually um, write custom code and, of course, put in the da put in the database, but it was essentially just a, a flat SQL file um, that you would feed into PSQL or, or whatever, however, or just run the SQL yourself, and that would throw your object into the database. But nothing in the database outside of a schema would really distinguish those objects from anything else in the database. So um, there's nothing to, you had no idea, unless you had some kind of external version control, it was, it was even, even if you had that, it's still hard to know what version of the code actually exists in the database at that time. Um, and there's no, other than removing the schema, there's no way to remove or uh, easily update and make sure your code is up to date in the database. And also there's nothing that if you have a dependency on some other code that you need in the database, there's no way to say, I need this other code in the database for my, for my code to run. So that's why um, this whole system was developed. So the install is very simple. Um, before the, before, I'll get into what goes into it before you get to the create extension part, but once the code files and stuff are in place, all you do is run one command and all your functions and everything are all installed. Uh, it's also versioned, so you, you give it a version number, a version name, you can call whatever kind of version you want to call it, so you know exactly what version's installed. It's very easy to update it, either update it or downgrade it, um, e either way. Uh, you can easily see which objects are part of an extension. So I can show you that here in PSQL here. So if I want to see what, I can see what extensions I have installed. Uh, so I have DBLink, Mimeo, PG Cron, I've been playing with, PG Partman, PG Tap. So if you want to see what objects are in your extension, you can do DX plus. So there's all the functions, a few tables, and a view that are all part of PG Partman. Um, and you can also have, uh, or it also prevents, uh, if, if an object is part of an extension, it can't be dropped unless you actually drop the extension. So it prevents accidental removal of, of critical uh, pieces of code. And you can also uh, have dependencies, um, like uh, I have Mimeo is dependent on DBLink. You cannot install Mimeo unless DBLink is already installed. So you can set those as part of the uh, creation. So getting started. Um, these are all links to the uh, PostgreSQL documentation. Uh, it's mostly centered around uh, Chapter 36. Um, there's, it's quite, quite extensive documentation, uh, both for how to package things together and actually building it to, in, to install onto a system. And these are, there's pretty much three commands that surround managing the extension. It's create them, alter them, and drop them. It's, it's very, very simple. Uh, the alter extension, um, uh, link in the docs actually does a, has a really good list of these are all the objects that you can make part of an extension in the in the database. So, so in the directory um, for where you're having your extension files, there's a few uh, there's a uh, a format to those files that has to be followed, most kind of like when you're developing a, a package for Debian or, or, or any other operating system, Postgres packages have uh, critical files and, and formats that have to be followed. The first one is it's uh, whatever your name of your extension is, uh, .control is the name of the file that exists in the top level directory of your extension. Um, the split between the two that I have this, the, between the two here is because these, the ones here at the top are the ones that I use most often. Um, these other ones are options that are there that are available that I really don't use. But um, so default version, uh, 
is when you say the create or alter extension uh, command and you don't give a version to that command, whatever is set in the default version of the control file will be the version that's installed into the database. Um, if you do it, uh, you can set a comment. And if you saw when I did the, uh, oops, wrong button there. When I did the DX, you can see the description of your extension. That's what gets put there. Uh, module path name is mostly for if you actually do C code. Uh, PG Partman is the only extension that I've written that actually has C code in it. A lot of my extensions are just plain PL, PL PG, SQL. So whether you need that or not is whether you're actually uh, compiling code. Requires is the flag to say whether you need another extension. It's just a comma separated list of other. It, it, the, the other thing has to be another extension. It can't just be some arbitrary thing, like DBLink is an extension, PG Crypto is now an extension. So it lists other extensions that are required for your extension. And relocatable is uh, just a Boolean that sets whether after you install the extension, whether it can be moved around to different schemas. Uh, I do, typically don't allow that because it just makes, makes co the coding of your extension on your end more com a lot more complicated. But um, you can uh, let people choose their own schema when they install it. So. Uh, that's actually, I'll just skip down to this last one. There is an option in the control file to set which schema it's installed to. I see a lot of extensions do that, and honestly, I think it actually makes it more difficult to manage because if the other person creates the schema first, it doesn't, it, it says, and, and then you try to like tell it to install to a schema, it won't let you install. You have to like not set the schema when you call the create extension command if the schema is set in the control file. And if people don't know that, it really confuses them. And it's, if I just confused you saying that, you understand what I mean. So um, I, would, I would advise not setting the schema in the control file. Let people set, set it to what they want it to be. Um, and then there's, I'll get into other things later, that you can dynamically just use whatever schema they picked in your code. Uh, directory is actually. Um, uh, norm normally, when you like when you call make install in the extension, it puts the files in a specific location, uh, and that's usually fine. But if you have a custom place where your extension code exists, you can set that in the control file. Uh, if you need to set the encoding, that's there. Uh, I've never set this one, but because I usually, so far the extensions I've written have to usually have to be run by a super user. Um, but if you want to have an extension that doesn't require a super user for anything, even the installation, you can uh, set that to false. But that means that whoever runs create extension has to have permission to do everything that's in your um, install file. So all of the object creation and everything. So can make it more difficult for you, but it also can make it easier for your users if you want to have it completely super user free. Any questions about the control file? You can actually do a secondary control file, which I didn't even know about until I was going to write this talk. Um, if you just do create extension, um, I, I've never actually given a version number do the create extension command. I usually just let whatever the default version in the control file uh, control things. But you can actually give a version number to the create extension command, and that will allow you to use these secondary control files. So if you want to do specific things for specific versions on install, you can have uh, these other Put, these, put them in this other secondary control file. Then if somebody gives the version to the create extension file, it will use this secondary um, control file. It uses all those same uh, options as before, except you, obviously you can't set the directory and default version for a specific version. So, The actual code that gets installed, and this is for a code that gets installed into the database, not compiled code, so like PL, PG, SQL code, that plain SQL code, Java, PL Java, PL Perl, whatever code you're getting installed into the database. Um, you create a file with this uh, uh, pattern to the name. So the name of the extension, which matches what was in the control file, for the, uh, which matches what the name of the control file was, and then whatever the version that you're, that's being installed is. So for uh, the latest version of PG Department that's out now is actually 3.0.1. I'm working on getting .2 out very soon. So this is the latest uh, SQL file for PG Partman. So all of your code goes into that file, and that's what's required to actually install the extension, is all of that script code has to be in that one file. Um, I'll get into some things later that make 
you can manage your code a little bit easier by putting them into different files and then pull them all back together. But for when it actually gets installed, all of that code has to be in that one file. So uh, this is the macro I was talking about. So if you, uh, you want to call one of your own functions that you want to ensure you're calling your own function, because it may, maybe you made another function called dblink for some reason, um, and you don't want the, the other call, fun, one to be called, you want to call your own, you can put this, it's a, uh, uh, at schema at, put that anywhere in your script code, and then when the create extension command is called, it automatically replaces uh, that macro with whatever schema the extension is in, actually installed in. So when, when, when that lets you let users put, install the extension to whatever schema they want to install to. And then once it's installed, if you actually go and look in the code in the database, you'll see all of those macros have been replaced with the, with the schema that the extension exists in. So I, f I find doing that a lot, makes it a lot easier for users than trying to set the schema in the control file. It's a lot, lot more user friendly. So. And this is actually where the major, the big part of that makes extensions great is being able to do controlled updates, upgrades, and downgrades. So um, for doing, it's, it's a similar file format. So it's the name of your extension, the old version, and the new version. That doesn't necessarily mean like old as in previous and new as in new. That means the, if you can do downgrades too. So your old version is a new one and you're downgrading to something else. So it goes either way. So this is saying I want to go from version 3.01 to that version 3.02. So, uh, so the code within the extension and the, and the versions and the file names are actually arbitrary. Um, I, I do semantic versioning for my thing. You can actually do whatever. You can do names for your versions. You can do alpha, beta, uh, Charlie, delta, whatever for your versions. It's kind of arbitrary. Um, and the Postgres isn't aware that 3.01 is less than 3.02. All it knows is you're going from 3.01 to 3.02. So if you want to do a downgrade script, you do, you do PG Partman 3.02-3.01. And that would mean you can go down or up. Um, and the code that goes into that uh, is relevant to whether you're doing the upgrade or the downgrade. So you kind of, it's all up to you what goes in that function and how you want to follow those code paths. Um, a big thing to be aware of is everything that runs in that update is done in a single transaction. So if you have things that have to be done in multiple transactions, you have to do multiple updates, and you have, to some, you have to do multiple versions, and you have to somehow make that clear to your user that when they do these version upgrades, they have to do them in, in one at a time. So say I had existing version is 1.2.3, and I wanted to upgrade to version 2.0, and there's 50 versions in between that. If you do a single command, from 1.2.3 1 to 2.0, it runs all of those updates individually in one giant transaction. So if you need to do those uh, versions, uh, those upgrades distinctly, you do the alter extension update command. You can give it a version, and it will do that. Whatever version you have installed now will update to that new one. So if you have multiple steps you have to do, you can do that. I ran into that when I had to. Um, I had to change the values of a constraint at the same time that I was changing the constraint, which can give a weird error if you do that in the same transaction. So uh, I forget the exact name of the error. I can go look. And it's, it's actually in one of the more recent updates of PG Partman that I actually had to do this with and what, why I became aware of it. Uh, so uh, yeah. It's. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's something about trigger, uh, triggers can't run in a, certain, in a certain way. But if you didn't know that in the first place, you still have to fix it somehow. And eventually, like, you'd have to drop it and rename it. And so, but there's some things that can't be done in a single transaction that, that would just never be able to be done. So this, this made me aware of that. And so I usually have like a change log file in my extensions that have like important information. Like the, the Postgres change log has important information about upgrading. So I try to do that. Um, yeah. Any questions about doing updates? Yeah, 
Yes, yes, there's, there's a distinct, so yeah, so I can, I can go over here to show you, here, let me show you. So I'd, uh, there's, I have an updates folder. I'll, I'll go over the structure that I use for mine later. So, so you can see I have all of these updates. So, so, so if somebody had 1.6.0 installed and they wanted to install 3.02, it would run every single one of these. One, it doesn't just run that one and go straight and run the 3.02 update. It runs all of them in between there, so it keeps things up to date. What's that? Uh, like I said, these, these number, the, the versions here are completely arbitrary. You can, you can name them uh, whatever you want to fit your architecture. I, like I said, I use semantic versioning, so I do the, the three dot thing. So whenever I had a new major feature, I would change the second number. That's You could. You would have to combine all of those updates together, and some of them. I mean, you maybe you maybe re. I, I, I guess yeah. You could you could do that if you wanted to. I haven't haven't needed to because if you if you have all those files there already, there it the extension management system does it all for you. So yeah, you could do that. And I'll actually get to something important about that in a, in a second here. So. Uh, oops. It's going off the screen there. And I can't get down to it. Let's see here. It's a little bit better. Uh, so when you give, uh, like I said, when you give no to up uh, clause to the alter extension, it will, so if you install a new version of the extension files into the file system, it has a new control file there. The new control file has a new default version in there. So if you give um, alter extension update no version, it will update your extension to whatever is in the control file on the files that are installed. But you can also actually give it specific versions. I usually try to do that just for my own sanity. Um, and like I said, any update scripts between the uh, install version and the target version always run in the order there. So um, like you saw that I had, uh, see here. Oops. I have all of these files here. It no so I have 5.1 to 6.0, then 6.0 to 6.1. So it follows those paths every time, all the time, because I have them in that order. So it will follow that order all the time of those files. Yes? I just want to go back to uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, downgrades. Yes. Yes. So if you wanted to go from if you wanted to go from from three it do, to do a reverse, if you wanted to do the 3.0 to 3.02, you'd write a file you'd write a file there that, that says PG Partman 3.0.2 dash dash 3.0.1, and that would be your downgrade from 3.0.2 to 3.0.1. Right. Yes. What's that? It, it, the, 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 the contents that are in the file, Postgres never looks at. It looks at the names of those files to determine the path that's being upgraded. The contents of the files are completely up to you. If you if you are missing if you're missing a like if 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 you're missing a file in here it will not it will say there's no upgrade path yeah so yeah and actually and, and you can actually do that there's this there's this really handy function I haven't really used this all that much because I I don't do downgrades and upgrades I pretty much just only do upgrades and keep things going consistently um, but uh, you can uh, use this function called pg extension update paths 
and it re returns the, the source. So this is the source version, the current version, the target version, and the path that it will take to upgrade. So going from 2.3.4 to 3.0, it will run 3.4, 2.4, 2.41, 2.42. It shows you the path that it's going to take to upgrade. So and um, if you I'm trying to get back to the here. So if you give no argument to, like you can see I gave the argument, uh, or I gave, a, I gave a where condition, I'm sorry. If you give no conditions to that function, like I said, where source and target equal that, it shows you every possible path on all of the files that you have, even, or all of the versions that you have, even if the path actually exists, it still returns, but it says there's a null path. So like, there's no possible way to do go from 2.3.4 to 1.1.0, but it still has an entry there, and it just shows a null. So you can you can find you can find out what upgrade path your code is going to take based on the based on the up, the version files that you have, and that lets you do something very handy, which is if you make a mistake and you need to skip a version, which I did in Mimeo. Um, I uh, did an up uh, so I want Mimeo is supposed to be 9.1 compatible, so the first the first uh, version that had extensions available, but I added a feature that was only in 9.2 by accident. So um, that was in version uh, version 10.0.10.0. I added a 9.2 feature, but I didn't want to do that. So if anybody that wasn't on was on 9.1 tried to install 10.0, it would fail, and there's no way for them to get around that without upgrading the database. So what I did was I, I removed that 9.9.2 feature, and so before it was going 9.0.9.3.0.10.0, I made it so it skips 0.10.0. So it goes from 9.3 straight to 10.1. And the way Postgres does the upgrade, uh, alter, the upgrade extension paths is it always takes the shortest path that's available. So you can see here, and you can see it's, it'll still give you all the paths. So if you do the, the PG extension upgrade update path, where source is this and the destination is anything 0.0.10, um, the upgrade path from uh, 9.3.0.10 is still there, but then there's a path here that's shorter. So it goes from 0.9.3 straight to 0.10.1, so it always takes the shorter path. And this is in the documentation too. If you do downgrades, always run this to make sure your downgrade doesn't cause a shorter path, because you can severely break your code because you'll uninstall it and reinstall it and uninstall it and reinstall it and who knows what state it'll be in after that if it even works. So if you do downgrade scripts always um, run this function to see what path your, uh, your extension updates will take. So, but that also lets people that, um, like people that were on 9.2, they installed this version without any problem and it will continue to work without any problem but they also still want to get the new version. So this allows people that were that did have 0.10.0 installed to still be able to upgrade past it because the path still exists. So I didn't I didn't completely remove the 0.10.0 update because somebody may have installed it and that would have broken it for them. So this does, does all this kind of make sense? This it was, took a while for me to wrap my head around it too when I had to actually do this. Yes. Uh, and then that, that branch after that go back to the I guess you could. The, the The important thing is if if you if you ha if you make another if you make another code uh, make another update that would short circuit another update to keep, it to keep it separate. You you can do that. You just have to make sure that new that new update incorporates everything that was in all those other paths before. You just, you ha you have to because it's never it's never going to run those in between updates again. So I have to make sure, like I, I had other updates that were in 0.10.0, besides the 9.2 things I did. I had to make sure that those were in the 0.10.1 update as well. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, 
I honestly don't know. I haven't looked at the internals of this at all. So yeah, but I mean, the, when I when I found out about this, it, it it's it's really complicated. But when you when I ran into this situation, this this whole short circuit path uh, feature made management of this code extremely easy. I mean, if you're trying to manage this without the extension system, it'd be even harder. So it it actually makes things. It makes manage, managing, ver, managing version code in the database very, very easy. So um, I, really, I really like it a lot. It's why I've been trying to, if, 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 if my code is at all common enough to, to, and, and that's, that's used enough that I want to make sure I have a certain version of it in the database, I always just turn it into an extension. Even if it's not something I release publicly, like internal code will we'll do that and stuff with too, just to make sure our internal code is consistent across clients. Um, or just the schema in general is consistent across clients. You can also, um, if you have code that's in your database already and you want to turn it into extension, you can do that. Um, and that's actually, that's, it's uh, the last, last two bullets here, but um, this is er everything that was a contrib module before 9.1 is now an extension. And you can, you can, if you have, like say you have DBLink installed already, you can, there's a, a what it does, it's, like, like I keep saying, these, these versions that are in these extension update files are kind of arbitrary. You can, you can make them whatever you want, and you use that arbitrary nature of it to do these kinds of things. So there actually is a from clause to the alter extension command. So if you specifically know you want to, want to install, you know, like from, now, from, from this point forward, you've been assuming that you're just updating the version you have installed now to the new version. So it's just if you don't have the from command, it's assuming you're just talking about what the version that's installed now. But if you give the from, uh, the from clause, it looks, at, it looks for the update path file that has that listed as the old version. So it does an up, update from that to the new version. So basically, the contrib uh, uh, system took advantage of that. And they, instead of like a version name, they just call it unpackaged. So there, if you look in the DB link source, there's a uh, file called dblink dash dash unpackage dash dash o dot o one dot o dot one or something like that. So that what that will do is take the code that's in the database now and if you look in if you just look in the contents of it, all it's doing there's there's a uh, a, a clause to the alter extension command to add objects to an extension. So you can say alter extension add table whatever to extension PG partman. So that's what the, that this uh, this update is doing. So you really don't give the two option to this because you're you're what is what is what when you do this you're pretty much uh, it's assuming you're taking the, the the code as it exists in the database now and install and uh, um, if somebody went and did that same thing like the 1.0.0 version of DBLink is pretty much what it assumes is installed when you run this and then if you want to update to a new version you then do the alter extension to update it this is, I know it's, Kind of confusing. Does that make sense, or does no, no, anybody under, not understand what I meant there? Then you would just do create extension. You'd, you'd install the contrib. you install the contrib package or the extension files, and you just run create extension. This is if you had DBLink installed before, or if you have a set of uh, objects that you want to turn into an extension, you can do this. Yeah, yeah, you probably, yeah, it, it, and that used to be the way you probably had to do it before because there was no, there was no system in place to, to remove things and replace them if they were broken. Now the extension system kind of has that because you can jump from version, different versions to, to make sure your code is in a consistent uh, place. So, yeah, this, this is, if, if, if this is making your head hurt, don't worry. It made my head hurt the first time I really started looking at this, trying to understand it. But um, I get, the point is to just make you aware of that there is a way that if you have code in your database now that you want to make an extension as it is now, you can do that. And then from that point forward, you can make new update files to update your extension code as if it was an extension. So basically, what you do is, if uh, if you wanted to reinstall that new code into another and that, into that code into another database someplace else, you'd have to pull that code out somehow and make a base version of that ex of that code as an extension that you could reinstall somewhere else. 
but this at least lets you do it with the code that already exists in the database. Any questions or need for clarity? I can try better. Sure. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. OK. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that actually in a second with uh, PG, some PG dump considerations. So basically it's, it's, it's around uh, this, this it, where it really comes at, into play is with, uh, if you have configuration tables as part of your extension. So um, extension objects, um, even like functions, tables, sequences, uh, the, anything that's part of the extension is not actually dumped out in a PG dump. The only thing that happens when you run restore is it runs create extension. That's it. So your extension objects do not exist in any PG dump anywhere. Unless, and, and, but, but so that also means that if, you, uh, reinst if you're reinitializing a database or something or restoring a backup, you have to have the extension files installed first before you run PG restore. Otherwise, PG restore will fail because the create extension command will fail. So this means that um, if you had a config table, like PG Partman has a config table to say what all the partition sets and, and stuff are, um, it won't dump out that config data. So if you go to restore a, a backup, all your PG Partman configuration is lost. So there is a flag you can set um, in the catalogs called a PG extension config dump. And you either, it's, most, it's mostly used for um, uh, like tables and, and sequences. So you, uh, you give it the, the name of the table, and that, what that does is it tells um, PG dump to dump that data out. It doesn't dump the object, like the, the definition of the object that's part of the schema. It just dumps the data out. So um, and the, if you want the whole data, all, all, of the, all of the data in the config, data, uh, config table every time, you can leave the second parameter blank. And then we'll, every time you dump, run PG dump, it'll dump all the data out of the config table. That's what PG Partman has. There's nothing pre-installed as part of any config table. But if you, have a con if you have some data that's part of your extension in the config tables, like I do with Mimeo, oh, I'm sorry, with, uh, I'm sorry, that's PG Jobmon, um, is another extension I wrote. There, there are some alert codes that I have in there as, as pre-configured data. So what you do is you use the second parameter as basically a where condition to say what data you want dumped out. So I don't want the alert codes 1, 2, and 3 dumped out as part of the PG Jobmon uh, uh, config, because the extension itself installs those. So the, this is irrelevant for sequences. So this is just for, for, for tables. So basically, you're telling, it what you, you're, you're telling it what data you want it to dump out of the config tables, so it will be restored in a PG, in a PG restore. Um, the thing that, and I, I don't know if this is fixed. I haven't, uh, I didn't get a chance to, to test this, but I know it was, it was like this in 9.1 and 9.2, because it's when I ran into it. Um, this data is always dumped out, even if you do a schema only dump, because this is schema, it's not data. What that means though is, um, like if P, what PG Jobmon is, is it's a system for um, logging the status of, of jobs that you have scheduled to run and make sure they run. That table can grow to gigabytes, but it's part of the extension. So I don't have that data being dumped out. There's really no way to preserve. It's either, it's either it dumps the data out every time, all the time, or it never dumps it out. So if you needed to back up that data that's part of your config, you kind of have to make it not part of the extension, dump it out, and make it part of the extension again. Um, this would be a something I wish they would fix somehow. somehow. I don't, I'm not exactly sure how it would fix it. Maybe a flag to PG dump to say whether to dump out extension data or not. Um, but it is an issue if you make, because you can make any table part of the extension. It doesn't have to be a config table. Um, it, you, can make your, you can make your orders table in your, in your, uh, mark, in your uh, shopping cart thing part of your extension. And then when you dump your schema out, you dump out a, a one terabyte table. So uh, it's, it, can be a, it can be a problem. So it's something just to be aware of. Yes? Uh, by any chance, uh, do you know the reasoning that was behind not including by default all the tables of the extension? 
because the create extension command is supposed to create them. Yes, but if uh, the the the, if the, the, the scheme. It only changes it don't logical by default to include everything and exclude by not the default. And I thought maybe you know the history of I I I know the reason they did it the reason they did it this way is because the schema of the table is part of the extension and to if you restore the database later, you may not be restoring the same version of it. it you you can actually install a new version of the of the of the extension later. And when you do a restore, it installs that new version of the extension because all it does is create the extension. Mm -hmm. The schema, the definition of the schema for that for that extension is contained in the extension itself. It's not part of something PG Dump does. Because if you have if you have PG Dump restoring it and then you do create extension, it fails out. We've actually had people do that because they had a. Um, I'm trying to remember exact. I, I can't remember how exactly they got into that situation where they were. Oh, it's because they were they were editing the PG. It was an, it was an SQL dump just like a plain text SQL dump that they were editing manually later to change data. But they like added the creation of a sequence back into that that was part of the extension. So when they tried to run a PG restore, it failed out when it tried, because it, it ran create extension, and then it tried to create the sequence again. Mm -hmm. And that would fail, because the sequence already existed. Okay. So yes? Uh, in in the in the SQL script file, so like where, wherever you're creating your table, you would like you do create table part part config, and then after that you uh, do um, select PG catalog, uh, or uh, you can set the property of that table. Um, actually, I can I can I can show you here. So yeah, let's see here. So SQL. So there's the part config table, and then at the end of that, I just right there. It's part of the definition of the table. Yeah. And do you use sequences in this table? Uh, in this one, I don't. Um, uh, and but in some other ones, I do. But if you say something like create table and uh, primary key, uh, etc., it, it is not included by default. Uh, if you set a primary key, there is a syntax when you run it. I don't for if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember it exactly, but you can say something like create sequence primary key, which will use a sequence. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. Serial. Make it a serial. Uh, yeah. Serial primary key or something. Yeah. Um, it. I mean, when you reinstall it, it would reinitialize the sequence when you go restore it later. There's there's no real way to pre preserve the the sequence data that I'm aware of. So um, this is actually not required, but this is kind of how I organized code in my extensions. Um, so this is at the level of where like the control file and everything is. Um, any kind of any any script file like I, I have some Python scripts that I, I have along with my extensions. I put them in the bin uh, bin directory. I have a doc directory for documentation. There's an SQL folder that I made that has all of the SQL scripts. Um, in it, um, do a source directory for C code. I have a tap uh, a unit testing for a test folder, and then all the updates I actually put in their own distinct folder. A lot of people with their extension, they kind of just put all that in the top level. You can, and that's actually where it kind of has to be in the end when you when you go uh, or however however you have it defined in your make file. Um, that's how it goes. But then also in the SQL folder, I have another folder called functions, tables, types. So you can see here in in um, PG Apartment, I have, there's the bin doc. So if you look in the bin directory, there's a bunch of Python scripts there. Um, uh, if you go to the SQL directory, I have the uh, functions, tables, uh, types. Um, we'll get to how this tape files, this file is made in a second. So, and then you already saw the updates folder. I have all the updates in that folder, in that folder there. So um, it makes, uh, Makes managing a lot easier because because when you actually install the extension, all of the script code has to be in that one file in the end for the extension to install. But when you're maintaining it, it's easier if you have them kind of separated out. And then I'll show you how to pull it back all back in together in a second. The and, and thing to be in, that's really important though, since you, since your update files are their own file and your SQL files in its own file, when you make an update, you have to be really 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 sure 
that the code in your individual files matches the code that's in your update files. So your, the code that's in your latest update file should match everything that's in your SQL directory uh, hierarchy. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I, there's this call, tool called meld that I use. It's basically a side-by-side -side diff tool that I use to I like open the update file in one folder and then update, op open all the other individual files on the other side and just kind of visually make sure they match. It's, it's tedious, but... Yeah, the, the thing that was, I, I, I saw, uh, but it's because all of the files are, all of the S SQL functions are in individual folders and individual files are all separate. So you just have to make sure you grab everything that's on those other ones. And the thing is, everything that's in those other files is not in the update file either. So you kind of have to yeah. make sure things match. So I, I don't have a huge extension that I maintain. So this, this method is, is, it's tedious, but it's trivial for my extensions. If you have a, an extension with thousands of functions and tables, that would be ungodly tedious. But it's something if you if you separate things out like this, you kind of you really have to make sure the code matches. Otherwise, you can end up in a weird state. This tool would be if you needed to do thousands of comparisons. This sort of thing would be useful for doing that. Okay. En masse, right? Okay. If there's a difference, blow up and yell. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually running a short, little bit short on time, so I can save questions. No, it's, no, it's fine. I, I just noticed. Um, save until the save until the end for right now. So um, this actually gets into actually how you build the extension now. So this is the this is pretty much the contents of your make file. Um, a lot of this is really ar I I'm, I can't get into a whole lot of detail here because it's really arbitrary to what your extension does. You can make your make do have your make file do whatever you want, but these are like the the key parts of of the make file. So PG config is basic. It's a path to the PG config binary of the installed version of Postgres. Um, when you when you do a make of an extension, it needs to know where PG config is, so it knows the version of Postgres you're building against. It, it uses the installed version. You don't need the source installed of of Postgres to build extensions. You just need to know where PG config is, so it can use the installed version of Postgres to build your extensions. Um, if you have C code, that's where you define your modules. Um, extension is a, is a thing that matches. So whatever you name the control, like pgpartman.control, so the extension variable means uh, the extension is named pgpartman. Um, where, th where things get installed to, the prefix is where is the binaries where Postgres is installed to. If you ever go and look in there, or, or wherever your operating system may throw these files, there's usually a folder called uh, share. And it has all the contrib modules and stuff underneath it. There's, by default, there's usually a folder called extension. And that's where, when you do make install, it puts everything. Um, if you have documentation files, this will put them into the doc folder that exists under the, under the shared directory. And there's this uh, system called PGXS, which makes the infrastructure for building um, uh, extensions not require you to have source installed. So you can just use the version of. You can just use the, the, the base install of your of Postgres without the source, and you, you put these lines in the make file. I'll show you a whole make file later. And it lets you build the extension without having to have source available, the source of Postgres available. Um, uh, these are, uh, the, the critical part of the extension is actually this data one. It's actually the files that are getting installed to uh, this the share extension uh, directory. So basically, what I did is I figured I, my my one my one venture into learning how Make works, was to see how to take a bunch of files that exist in a folder and pull them all together into one file. So that's what this that's what this line does right here. Actually, both both of these lines here. So this uh, ex this is like a macro for the extension name, a macro for the extension version. So this would be like PG Part Band 3.0.2. Um, and then it basically goes through. It goes first. It gets the type, goes to the types table, uh, types folder. Then it goes to the tables folder. Then it goes through the functions folder and grabs everything. And then this make macro says take everything, take everything that exists after this colon, which is this uh, uh, dollar quote there, and put it into the and put it into this file.
uh, I, I'll get to that a little bit later. If if uh, if you have if you have something you need to run before, like at the beginning of your uh, extension, in, in, so, and you need and you need to have something run at the end. If you sort the things, you know, like I know for now, like the, the types are always going to be first, and that type file will always run first. And then the last function alphabetically will always be the last thing that runs. So that's why I do the sort there. It's kind of arbitrary for me. And then so that makes the, when, when you saw the, the SQL directory there, I had run make already, when well, that's why that file was there. So if I run make clean. Now that file's gone. Then if I run make, now that file's there. So that takes everything that was in the SQL file and throws it all into that one file, because that one file is what the create extension requires to, to exist. So and then extra clean is just what I use to clean up that dynamically generated file when somebody runs make clean. That's all. Yes? It's worked. It's worked. It's worked on Solaris, Debian, Red Hat, uh, and, and a couple uh, FreeBSD. So it's worked on a couple so far. On, on Nixon. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it may not work at all. It, it could possibly. And if you could wait till questions at the end for right now. Um, so and then this is also you can do to uh, actually ch check and make sure. So, so PG Partner requires 9.4.0 at a minimum. So I have the make file um, do this for me. If somebody tries to run make install with 9.4.9.2, it will fail out. It's not very elegant. I actually got this from, as you'll see uh, later, I got this from uh, the PGXN um, website. It's, it's just basically a grep looking through the, the shell of what PG version you have installed. And then if it's 9.4, bail out. So, or less than 9.4, bail out. So this is my full make file here. So you can see I have the, uh, this actually, it dynamically figures out what the extension version is based on the control file, uh, what's, what's the default version in the control file. So um, there's the, all the 9.4 stuff, if it exists, do all this stuff. Um, So um, from here on out, this is just my personal ex tips from my personal experience. Um, this isn't anything that's required uh, for doing extensions. But um, whenever you create an object, always explicitly name it, even if Postgres can dynamically name it for you, for example, for indexes and for foreign keys. Because if you have to go back and change those things later in an update, if you didn't name it, you have no idea what it got named. On the person's target directory, because if you do, if you do a, a like a, a functional index on a column, it just it just calls it index one, index two, index three, index four, index five. It, you have no idea what it's going to be called. So, just an example for the part config table, um, even the primary key, you want to name the primary key. Don't do like ID uh, default primary key when you define the column. Define the primary key later using the constraint option. Same with foreign keys for indexes. Give the index name. Um, that makes things a lot easier if you have to do updates later. Otherwise, you kind of have to assume what people are doing, and then you're, when they run the install, their update breaks, and then you have to explain to them why, which I did have to do before I started doing this. Um, preserving privileges. So at some point, you will have to drop and recreate a function because you have to redefine the arguments or the return type of that function. Or any object, really. You may have to redefine it somehow. But functions is where I run into this most often. So um, I kind of use a little bit of uh, I, uh, the, the SQL script files can contain any SQL you want. So I create a temp table. What I do to, to do this is I create a temp table. And then I, I, I know for functions, it's, they're going to have an execute permission. So, but you can also look up what permissions an object has and reuse those. But I'm always going to want to grant execute on that function to whoever had execute on it before. So that's what I'm doing here is I'm looking up the information schema. Um, so what I do is I look that up first. I store that in the temp table. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I drop the function. But you can see in here when I grant the execute, this is, it's only got two arguments here. So this is the new definition of the function. And then I drop the old definition of the function here. 
and there's more in the, in the next slide. So I preserve the functions in a temp table, pre preserve the privileges in a temp table first, and then at the end of the at the end of the script file, I go through and just do a little bit of anonymous function here with a do a do statement and rerun all the statements that are in that temp temp table, and that restores the privileges that were there before. Because I rec I dropped the function, but then I recreated it later in my in my uh, extension update code. So um, that's something to be aware of. Is if uh, especially if you have a publicly available extension, you have no idea what grants somebody may have given your, your objects. So you kind of want to preserve those whenever you can. Yeah. I don't know if this is true or not, and I have not been able to recreate it, but I've had several people tell me this, that if, like you can see here at the bottom, I dropped the temp table I created. So there's a pop depending on what your update is doing, when the transaction ends, yeah, I've had people tell me this happens, and I've never been able to recreate it, but I'm just putting it out there as a warning. And, but it will, when, it, when, when the transaction ends and it drops to temp tables, if that cascade is somehow related to anything you did, it may drop the entire extension because that extension object, in, uh, I, I know. Schema. I don't know. <laughs> I've had people tell me this happens, and I've never been able to recreate it. Yes. If, uh, if you have something in, if you create a foreign key in the temp table, maybe that might do it. But yeah, so referencing the temp table, that's a good reason. Yeah, so that may uh, whatever happens there. Yeah. In an upstream update script, anything you create is automatically attached to the type. Yes. So, uh, I need to make that part of my thing too. Yeah, anything you create, anything you create in a, an extension update, automatically be becomes part of the extension. Um, I need to I need to add that to my notes. So if you if you create if you like for the for the par partition function, I never I never recreate partition the, the the trigger partition functions as part of the extension update. I make it a note because if I did that, then the trigger function would become part of the partman extension. Does that make sense? So yeah, it, it can I need to, I need to add that to my to my talk. Um, version checking, um, if you need to make sure there's a minimum version of Postgres installed. Um, actually, this is a recent thing that somebody I never even realized you could do, is just do current version, cast it to int, and then compare it to a number. That's a very, very easy way to do it. I actually had this really overcomplicated version check, uh, check version function before. But this, doing it this way it lets you also account for, I basically split it at the dots and checked each, each number. But that also lets you deal with betas, alphas, RCs in a, in a custom way if you, if you needed to. But if you just need to make sure there's a minimum version for a, uh, some kind of feature, you can just do the, the if condition using that. Um, and in, C, in the C code, there's actually a, a if a macro. So um, in 10, they change the, the way the background worker uh, struct is, is, is arranged. So before 10, it was just a simple um, BG worker, BGW main. Now it was split out into these two, two things. So if you have code that need, that only needs to compile in certain versions, this is very very handy. I found that by looking in like DBLink code and stuff and seeing how they deal with it. So um, another thing to be aware of is object names have a maximum length, uh, which is six, by default sixty three characters. So if you have like the partition extension, it adds a suffix onto whatever table name somebody has. But that suffix is very, very important. It tells you what the contents of that data is. But if somebody's table is already 61 characters long and I try to add the suffix onto it, then I'll run into naming collisions because it'll all have the same name. It, Postgres will automatically truncate things for you. So I just basically did this check name length function. It basically takes anything you give it, truncates it down to at least 61. Uh, it gets the length of the suffix you're adding onto it, truncates the original name down. So it's always at maximum 63 characters. So just something to be aware of. That's in the, in the PG Part Man uh, source if you wanted to take a look at that. Um, avoid enums. Uh, mostly because they're very, very hard to edit. Not because they're bad. Enums are fine. They're just bad in extensions. 
because uh, they're gotten a little bit better in 10. Um, you can actually add, add things to them easier, but you still can't delete them. Tr it's not trivial to delete them. You kind of have to recreate the enum. And if you made a type or something for somebody as part of your extension, they would have to completely drop all, every table that had that type or do something to change the value of the enum. So my advice is you just avoid them in extensions altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially for a especially for something that's like a default value of a column, because if you have to change that default value later, you have to edit the enum, and that's not that's not. If you need to remove a default value, that's not trivial. So, uh, this is a, a thing. If you look in the DB link code, if you want to prevent people from running PSQL, um, then just installing your extension, it'll stop them from doing that. Because it'll actually break. If you use that extension macro, you can't run PSQL to install the extension. So this just gives them a nice error message instead of, instead of letting them try to do that. Uh, almost done here. I think that's, yeah. So that's pretty much, uh, so PGXN is a, is a network where you can buy, download a bunch of extensions. It's where I upload all mine to. They have a command line tool to make it easier to manage. And if you have a complicated code, Go look at PGTAP. It's a unit testing framework for any SQL code. Um, uh, I use it in two ways. So you can have each file be its own uncommitted transaction. So you, when you run the tap test, it just automatically undoes everything it did. Or if you look at the Mimeo extension, I actually have one tap test depend on the one before it. So I just number them so they run in order um, and then clean up things at the end. But um, like for PG Partman, I just counted yesterday, I have like over 7,000 tap tests for just making sure all of the different time and ID series types and stuff work. So it, see, it's the only reason my code is somewhat stable when I release it, because I, I kind of run, run, run all my code through this to make sure it, it's at least predictable for the things that I know that I want to account for. Um, so I, I ha if you do any extension development at all, I highly, highly, highly recommend you go take a look at PGTAP and make it part of your uh, your extension code that, uh, to make sure everything is working. So that's it. Uh, if you, uh, Dimitri Fontaine is actually the developer that made the extension uh, system in Postgres. So if you ever see him at a conference, you can thank him for that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other links for, uh, for things on extensions and Postgres. Thank you. <laughs>